For problem number one, we're running an experiment in number of times. There's more than three outcomes. And P sub I represents the probability of each outcome. The question here is, what formula would we use for the expected count of each of the individual outcomes? Now, the expected count is how many times we would expect each outcome to occur out of the total n trials. So I just made up a value for n. I think it can be helpful to think through this problem with looking at some real numbers. So I just created a value for n of 200 times we're going to run an experiment. How many times would we expect to get outcome 1? How many times would we expect to get outcome 2? And so on. So I've just listed the first three outcomes. And I've also listed the probability of each outcome. And again, I made these up just like I made up the value for n, our total number of independent trials. This is p sub 1, the probability that outcome 1 occurs. This is p sub 2, the probability that outcome 2 occurs. So what would be the expected number of times outcome 1 will happen out of 200 trials? It would be 10% of the 200 trials. And how do you calculate that? You multiply that probability by the total number of trials. So if you, if you did that, if we do 0.10, 10% times 200, you get the expected number of times that outcome one will occur. And you could repeat that then for each outcome to get the expected count for each of the different outcomes. So that's our solution. The expected count for each outcome is the total number of trials multiplied by the probability of that particular outcome. For number two, we're running what's called a goodness of fit test. And we have four different possible outcomes. We're calling them A, B, C, and D. And here's what we expect to see, that all the outcomes have the same um, number of occurrences. That's our null hypothesis, that the proportion of each outcome is the same. And then we actually have observations, our actual statistics from gathering data. And we're going to see if those line up if our actual observations are a good fit for what we expect, or if they're not, which would mean at least one of the proportions is different from the others. To conduct this type of hypothesis test, we use the chi-square distribution. The degrees of freedom is one less than our number of categories. So A, B, C, D was four. We're going to have three degrees of freedom. To get the test statistic for our chi-square distribution, we're going to want to open this data here in StatCrunch. And here we go to Stat, a goodness of fit test, and we're using chi-squared. And so our observations are actually in the column called observed, and our expected um, outcomes are in the column called expected. So hit compute, and it gives us back our chi-squared test statistic there. Like all hypothesis tests, we're going to compare our test statistic to the critical value. If it's further past the critical value into the tail of the, of the distribution, then it's in the rejection region, and we will reject our null hypothesis. To get the critical value, it all depends upon alpha. So going back into stat crunch, go into stat calculators, and we're in the chi-square distribution. And so our degrees of freedom was 3. Enter that. And we're looking for the tail of the distribution, so we want greater than. This is where the critical value is going to show up, so let's leave that blank. Over here, we want to put our alpha. So we want to know what that critical value is. That'll leave 5% in the tail, and here it lists our critical value. In red, we see the rejection region, any test statistic. In the rejection region will cause us to reject the null hypothesis. Our test statistic is not greater than a critical value and so uh, the test statistic for our null hypothesis is less than or equal to the critical value for a alpha of 5% significance level. So no, we will not reject the null hypothesis. For number three, we have another goodness of fit hypothesis test. And in this example, we're looking at um, colored candies and what the manufacturer states should be uh, the percentage of each candy in the back, uh, what, what percentage of each color should show up in the back. And then we actually test that by gathering some data. 
and the listed outcomes from actually gathering the data of how much each color showed up are listed here. So for our null and our alternative hypothesis, with a goodness of fit test, our null is always that the distribution is actually going to line up with what we expect, in this case what the manufacturer says the color breakdown should be. The alternative is that the distribution is not the same as what the manufacturer states. So we need to uh, take this data, I'm going to load it into StatCrunch, copy it over. So I actually typed this in StatCrunch so I would have it in here. We first need to figure out how many total candies were counted. So we'd want to add up all these numbers. You can do that on a calculator or uh, we can do it here in StatCrunch. I'm just going to go to Stat Summary Stats of our column. So in the Frequency column, I'm looking for the sum. And when I hit Compute, it tells me there's 400 total candies that were counted. So to run this goodness of fit test, what we need to know is what we expect to see when we're gathering our data. And so our expectations will be based upon the distribution that we're, uh, we're told exists, in this case, by the manufacturer. So based off of those probabilities for each of the different colors, how many of the 400 would you expect to be each of the different colors? So I'm going to go here to compute an expression. I'm going to click on build. And so using those probabilities, I want to multiply each probability times 400 because there was 400 total candies. And I'm going to call that then the expected count. And so out of the 400, if there's 13% that are brown, I would expect 52 of them to be brown. If there's 14% yellow, I would expect 56 of them to be yellow, and so on. So fill in those expected counts, and then we're going to use the chi-square distribution to find the test statistic. Here we want to go to stat, and we're running a goodness of fit test with the chi-square distribution. What we actually observed when we looked at the candy was in the frequency column. What we expected to get based off the um, probabilities the manufacturer told us were in the, was in the expected count column. And so when we hit compute, we get our chi-squared test statistic and the p-value for that. And our, our significance level alpha was 0.05, so our p-value is less than alpha, which like all hypothesis tests, if the p-value is less than um, alpha, we will reject the null hypothesis. In this case, that means uh, there is evidence that the distribution of colors of the candy is not the same as what the manufacturer states. And number four, we're doing a goodness of fit test. And the scenario here is that we have some allegedly fraudulent checks uh, that someone might have been using to embezzle funds. And there is a law called Binford's Law about the probability of what the first digit should be, eh, whether it's a one, a two, a three, and so on. And so here's the probability breakdown of what the first digit showing up in a number should be. And so if these checks are actually valid, we would expect them to follow Binford's Law. If these checks are invalid, if they're fraudulent, uh, they'll follow some other distribution. So we're um, going to want to open that data in StatCrunch in just a second. But first, to set up our null and alternative hypothesis, we want to use a very small level of alpha because we're accusing someone here of fraud. So we'll use the smallest uh, one that we typically use, which is 0.01. And then our null hypothesis is that the checks are good, uh, that they're valid, which means they will follow Binford's law. The alternative would be that the checks are fraudulent so that they follow some other um, distribution besides Binford's law. So now jumping into StatCrunch, we first need to get our expected counts based off of Binford's law. So let's compute an expression here. We're going to build it. So the frequencies, or sorry, the probabilities stated in Binford's law here, I want to multiply those by the number of checks we have. The problem stated it was 214. And I'm going to call that then our expected count. So out of the 214 checks, out of the 214 checks, we would expect to see this many start 
uh, with a leading digit of one. We would expect to see this many start with a leading digit of two and so on if the checks actually follow Binford's law. They're not fraudulent. So let's go up to goodness of fit test. We're using the chi-squared distribution. Our actual observations are in the frequency column. We're actually looking at the checks written. What we expected to see if these checks are valid and follow Binford's law is in the expected count. So we get our chi-squared chi test statistic, and it has a very, very small p-value. This is less than our alpha, so we will reject the null hypothesis. So enter those answers. We are rejecting the null. So it means this distribution of checks, they're not following Bill, uh, Binford's law, um, which means they probably are fraudulent. So could we think he, this employee is guilty of embezzlement? And the answer is yes. The first digits of the checks are not following uh, Binford's law as they should if they were valid checks. For number five, we're doing another goodness of fit hypothesis test. And we're looking at fatal motorcycle accidents. And we have the uh, proportion of where that person's injured in the fatal accident. And we have that distribution. And then we're going to compare accidents where people are not wearing a helmet to see if it follows that same distribution or if it has a different distribution. So our null hypothesis is going to be that it follows the same distribution. The alternative is that people not wearing a helmet, um, their injuries follow a different distribution. So from observations, looking at people, 2,053 riders in accidents not wearing a helmet, we have this. We need to fill in the expected count. Where would we expect to see their injury uh, based off of the probabilities here listed in the table? So open up the data in StatCrunch. To calculate the expected count, we're going to go to Compute and Expression. I'm going to build it here. Take those probabilities uh, and multiply them by the total number of riders we saw. I got data from, and I'm going to call that column expected count. So if it follows the same distribution out of those 2,053 riders, I would expect this many to have injuries in multiple, location, multiple locations, this many to have head injuries, and so on. Now that we have the expected count, we can go to our goodness of fit test, chi-square. Our observations were in the frequency column. Our expected count is in the expected count column. Hit compute, and we get our test statistic and the p-value. This is a very small p-value. It's less than our level of alpha, so we will reject the null hypothesis. Rejecting the null means there is sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis, which in this case is that we have a different distribution. The distribution uh, fatal injuries for riders not wearing a helmet is different compared to the distribution of injuries for all motorcycle riders in general. Why might that be the case? That's what this last question is asking about. Uh, compare and observe the expected counts for each category. So if you look at this, where we expected to see the injuries, we actually see less in every single um, row here except for head injuries. There's more observed head injuries for riders not wearing a helmet than what we expect. Uh, and that makes sense. If you don't have a helmet on, you're more likely to get a head injury.